Ready? Yep. <laughs> Welcome everyone to the latest hot and cold list where we discuss what is hot and cold in comic books. I'm your host, Brian Wood. With me, as always, is my co-host, Jack DeMeo, a.k.a. Mr. Bolo. And you are watching the Simple Man's Comic YouTube channel. The one source for all things comic book and pop culture related. So if you haven't done so already, Hulk smash that thumbs up, hit that subscribe button, and ring the bell so you'll be notified whenever future videos are released. Jack, what's going on, buddy? Man, real happy to be here. As always, we own Wednesdays here on another Wednesday, another hot and cold list. And we missed a week last week, so a lot has moved on the market. There's a lot of stuff that's really getting hot, heating up. And of course, the more things heat up, some things are going to get forgotten, slip through the cracks, and become cold. We missed a week, but that just makes this one all that much better. Because last week especially, we had a hot week in comics. So you're going to see some of that heat rolling right into the list this week. And as always, we want to bring in our list contributors, right? We have... The hot and cold bit contributors. These are authors from comicbookinvest.com. Jack, what do you have to say about these guys? Oh, man, these are the best guys in the industry, in the business. We call them our spec super team. And uh, they are comprised of just a diverse group of writers who cover everything from the high end to the low end, from the golden age to the modern. We've got everything in between. And these guys are ready to bring the hot and the cold. Right. But we even have something special this week. We're going to kick the hot list off with a special guest pick. And we are talking about Edwin from Comics Jabroni YouTube channel. If you haven't checked out Comics Jabroni, make sure you check it out. Fantastic channel. He does a lot of great comic book and a bunch of other reviews and different content as well, especially video games. A lot of great retro video games on there. But we're going to kick this list off with the guest pick from Edwin at Comics Jabroni's YouTube channel. Yo, what's up, CBSI Nation? It's Edwin, the comic jabroni, coming at you. My pick this week for the hot list has to be IDW's run of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. With last week's success of Ninja Turtles issue number 95 and all the spec value that can be had with that, I think going back into the run of, you know, issues 1 through 94, there are great key issues to be had that you can still find for cheap. Number... Issue number five, this right here, key issue, low distribution. In this issue, we get Master Splinter giving the Turtles their colored bandanas, guys. This is a great issue to have. There's a cover A and a cover B for this. Issue 24, City Fall, part three. Leonardo becomes a member of the Foot Clan, and he becomes the lead soldier for the Shredder. Definitely a story that needs to be read, guys. With Jenny becoming that first female ninja turtle you guys and everybody out there should be on the lookout for her first appearance that's going to be issue number 51 this is right after issue 50 where shredder gets beheaded by master splinter so it's a whole new world with master splinter leading the foot clan guys go find issue number 51 idw does a lot of four issue five issue mini series that are tied to the main line story and this is one of the bigger ones right here guys this is going to be the secret history of the foot clan issue number one in this story you're going to get the first appearance of kitsune and you also get the first appearance of takeshi tatsuo who was the original leader of the foot clan his soul embodies the shredder and kitsune is a witch who brings shredder back to life she's going to be a major player in all the issues leading up to issue number 100 on top of the main line story for turtles you also have another turtle story that is called teenage mutant ninja turtles universe this is issue number one guys very cheap can still be had but you get a first appearance of a mutant in here by the name of zodi which is a scorpion mutant and she is like the hitman for this organized crime unit of mutants in New York City. So guys, I'm Edwin the Comic Jabroni. Go check me out on YouTube. Check me out on Instagram. My my pick for the hot list this week is IDW's run of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Go out there, go find them. Let me know if you found them, guys. So till next time, peace. So again, thank you, Edwin, at Comic Jabroni's YouTube channel. Privilege to have him on for a guest pick this week. Definitely check out his channel, guys. Fantastic videos. Can't say enough about it. But just as fantastic as his channel, 
was his freaking pick, right, Jack? I mean, there's no denying Ninja Turtles right now are hot. People that weren't tracking the comic, the series right now, are now because of issue 95. But he gave you a bunch of issues leading up to it that makes this all the more of a hot pick. What do you think, Jack? Well, I absolutely agree. I love his pick. Um, he's a guy interested. I wasn't familiar with him or his channel until a few days ago. And, you know, I had been putting out the bolos for the Ninja Turtle first appearances. And people kept tagging me and tagging him. And they were crediting him as being one of the first people, if not the first people, to be out there pushing uh, the narrative that, hey, look, 95 is a key issue. So shout out to Edwin. Absolutely all credit due. And that's why, again, he's here on the show. Um, and, you know, we've been talking a lot. Today is Tuesday. We filmed this for Wednesday. So today on Instagram, you may have noticed we had a little TMNT Tuesday takeover. Lots of content as it relates to Jenny, of course, the new female Ninja Turtle. Um, a lot was coming out today. Uh, there was a lot of speculation last week when this book dropped on the third that, oh, you know, you got to remember IDW. They, you know, they had the death of Master Splinter, the death of um, Donatello, and none of these events stuck. But now Tom Waltz, the creative director and writer, uh, is putting out information. Sophia Campbell, the artist who designed the character, is putting out information. It really looks like this is a character that's here to stay, and that's going to make this um, TMNT 95 spec even hotter. And as Edwin pointed out, that number 51, her first appearance altogether in the series. Um, we're already seeing movement on the 1 in 10 artist edition incentive. That book, the most recent sale is like $80. And this was a book that was sub $10 just a week ago. We're also seeing for issue 51, the fried pie variant, a variant that was sold at Books of Millions and Second and Charles's and was probably sitting under a table for a few dollars just a few months ago seemingly dried up and is now selling in the mid 40s there's also an, a really rare rhode island comic con variant that even cbsi's own topher who's a rhode island resident hasn't been able to put his hands on in the wild You're shitting me! there doesn't seem to be people who have this book so that is one to keep an eye on there's one currently up for auction right now and i'm tracking that one myself to see where that's gonna end up so obviously I am happier than can be because I am an IDW homer. I love IDW product. I love these 80s and 90s cartoons. And Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is one of those things that connects with most of us of a certain age. And Brian made a point. This, this really hit with lapsed Ninja Turtle fans, casual Ninja Turtle fans. We've seen this before, guys. And this is what we talk about on the CBSI Bolo Show. A lot of times my long-term plays of the week play into these kinds of picks. And we've seen this before with G.I. Joe when they brought in the first female Snake Eyes. All of a sudden, it brought all of these new buyers and collectors into the G.I. Joe market, and we saw prices escalate. But we've got to admit, Ninja Turtles is a good bit bigger than G.I. Joe. The movies have been more successful. It's more synonymous with kids. Kids have grown up loving it. I think Edwin did a great job pointing out those first appearances. I'll be honest with you. I wasn't familiar with a few of them so i went ahead and took notes myself and i suggest you guys out there with the simpleman's comics family and cbsi nation do the same i'll also point out there are some other issues as it relates to jenny that have heated up we've seen the comics and ponies virgin variant for 95 is scorching at like 200 dollars. we've seen the montreal comic-con variant featuring ufc fighter george st pierre on the cover going for about $60 for the color and $100 for the black and white variant. Um, we're also seeing talk of upcoming uh, TMNT.com variant, which IDW has had blacked out and hasn't shown up on TMNT.com, which is actually owned by Nickelodeon. So that's one we're going to have to be on the lookout for in the future. And there's some other books. Uh, issue 52, she unmasks for the first time. Issue 56, she joins up, uh, I believe, with the Turtles. It's kind of a key issue. Um, and issue 92, she's featured on the cover of the B variant, which is done by Kevin Eastman. So these are all books that, no, those won't pop the way first appearances will. But they're worth picking up, especially at the low prices that they're currently going for. We've never seen anything like this in Turtle lore, at least in the modern Turtle lore. So this is something to really keep an eye out for. And I think one thing that really Edwin pointed out was how many other books are now gonna get attention as these increased eyes go on to the TMNT series. I am an advocate of these retailer incentive variants. I don't think there's a ton out there on the market. And I think if you can pick up these retailer incentives anywhere from three to $10, 
They're great buys. I've been doing that myself. And I think more and more collectors are going to jump on board the TMNT wagon. And I think you want to be early and first. And the final thing I'll say is I'll put a little plug out for our Simpleman's Comics Patreon because we have put some exclusive bolos as it relates to this TMNT event in our Patreon that you're only notified if you're a member. So go ahead and join. Pick your tier. Um, bolo boxes are currently sold out, but uh, you never know if more may pop up in the future. But get in on the Patreon because we're going to be putting out more links and exclusive bolos in the future. Right. So – on the Patreon, the community within that is freaking fantastic. I know I say that a word a lot, but it definitely describes the community that we have in the Patreon. Superman's Comics family, all alone, that huge community, great as well. But we also are having a great conversation. We got Discord going on. We have multiple tiers. Everyone's sharing bolos, but good time. Patreon.com forward slash Simple Man's Comics. Be honored if you guys would check it out. But again... Thanks to Edwin for that pick, and we're going to move right on into the next pick, and it is Dan Piercy from the Reading Pile article on comicbookinvest.com. Hey, y'all. This is Dan Piercy of dpiercyscomics.com, home of the Reading Pile on CBS side. So, my hot pick this week shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. It's this Walking Dead 193. Um... You know, the story's all in this. Um, we didn't find out until the week of that this was actually to be the last issue. So it took folks somewhat by surprise. I went to several LCSs and they were sold out. Um, the one I regularly buy from, they only had four left after their uh, poll customers, of which I was one. So I secured my reader. Uh, I recommend selling these in sets with uh, 191 and 192. These are actually going out the door after I finish filming this. So, and I do think it uh, this particular issue will retain some heat for a while. But you know, get out your crystal ball for that. So that is my hot pick for this week: Walking Dead 193. See ya. So there we go, Jack. We have Dan's pick: Walking Dead 193 is the hot issue this past week. But 192, especially that commemorative issue that came out and the regular cover, and 191, all three of those, with a surprise, hey, this is the last issue. I mean, that came out of nowhere. People were, I mean, spoilers started going out, what, a night or two before release day, so people were aware of it on release day, but it still was a surprise. I loved 193. I think we even talked about 193, worth a long-term hold and an investment in your collection on this channel, on the CBSI Bolo Show as well. But what are your thoughts on this one, Jack? Well, I like this pick. Um, again, like you mentioned, Dan highlighted 193. I think you really got to look more than that. I think he hit the nail on the head about selling sets. We've talked about that, and Dan is one of really the CBSI originators on that. Because he's such a reader, um, it's been his strategy to lot up books. I think lotting up books will help you get maximum dollar for these books because most people, man, they want 191, 192, and 193. I think you made a great point about that 192 second print. I think it's being slept on. Um, it came out obviously the same day as 193, so all of the attention was on 193, which is part of the reason why Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 95 got so hot because so much attention was on Walking Dead 193, and rightfully so. I mean, it's a monumental moment in comics, and we talk about this sometimes on the Simplest Comics YouTube channel. Obviously, on my long term play, I did my little retailer rant. Um, shout out to you guys, I, I think that was well received, um, even though there was some pushback from certain people I, I think that we will do more of that in the future i think you guys enjoyed seeing um some of what you go through um through our eyes we, we go through it too we're, we're just like you guys we're collectors we're uh we're fans but um and also i want to say brian mentioned it in the previous pick how great simpleman's comics family is you guys blew me away how many people offered to send me that book for free then I just feel bad taking any of your books. But so many of you reached out to me and offered to send me that book for free. I thought that was a basic. But I think this whole series is a long-term play. This 191, 992, 193, because you cannot deny the fandom of Walking Dead. And beyond that, these shows, the show is going to continue. They've got movie deals coming in with the principal actors. They're, they're talking about doing prequel stuff um, on film. So I really think that this series is going to be iconic and part of comics lore forever. It reminds me a lot of something like Watchmen or something like that. And I know it's tough because it just ended to say something like that. But I really have a feeling that 10, 15, 20 years from now, it's not going to matter. People are still going to want Walking Dead. I also would say watch out to some of you out there who are talking about 
dumping your Walking Dead right now because the series is over, I think you could be premature with that. Now, I understand, you know, you may have lost your passion for it because it's done. And by all means, from a collector perspective, go ahead. But um, I really think that Walking Dead is going to have longevity. I also am wondering if Robert Kirkman won't come back to it someday. Maybe not continue, but there's a time jump. And you can always go in between, and you can always go before. As Brian mentioned on the CBSI Bolo show, we still don't know how the zombie outbreak occurred. And I still think that's a big story to tell. And it may not be Kirkman who tells it. He may bring in somebody else to write that story at some point. Um, I think he really wants to focus on his other properties, Invincible, Oblivion Song, um, so on and so forth, as they kind of move to adaptation. Um, but... I think The Walking Dead right now is definitely red hot. We're seeing the the 192 blank variant is selling for $20. We're seeing um, uh, the second printings are moving. There's a second printing coming out for 193 but I wouldn't expect that to be much on the market. It looks like there's just a trade dress color change. And I think retailers are going to make up for all of the missed opportunities to sell the readers on the first print. So... I don't know that that'll be a high value second print, but I think if you are like me and you didn't get a copy of that first print, that's your opportunity to grab it and read it. And like everybody says, it's, it's a great read and a great story. It may not have ended the way you want, but we can't judge somebody else's art like that. It, we, you know, it's not our place to say how that story ends. I'm talking to all of you Game of Thrones fans, but I think uh, I think it, I think that this is is hot right now. But I think that it's going to maintain popularity over time. It may not be the hottest thing on the market. It may even fall into the cold list at some point as people fade and look other places. But I think Walking Dead will always be important, and it's a good long-term play. So another great pick from Dan Piercy, and we're going to roll right into the next pick. And this one comes from Run the Table author Clint Jocelyn. Good afternoon, CBSI Nation. Clint Jocelyn coming to you with my hot pick of the week. And my hot pick of the week this week is anything and everything doing with Taskmaster. Since the strong rumblings and rumors and... Supposed pictures came through. You're starting to see a lot of movement with those books. Cameo, first appearances. Some of those Cable versus Deadpool covers. You're starting to see move a little bit. I'll tell you what, though. There's a lot of buried treasure within there. They have some really cool covers that I think are going to start coming to the surface. There's some older stuff, too, from the mid-'90s, like from Malibu, that I think you're going to see rise to the surface. Taskmaster is a really cool character. And there's a lot of books and great storylines with him that I think that you're going to start to see unearthed. But I think if you start to move on it now, do a little bit of homework, maybe read Run the Table next week, hint, hint, you're going to see some of that stuff really pay, pay off dividends down the road. So my hot pick of the week this week is Taskmaster. Again, nothing's announced for sure, but it sure seems like that's what's going to hit. So go out and find him. The book's going to bring you money, and it's a hell of a character. There it is, Jack. Clint's talking all things Taskmaster as hot. I tend to agree with him, especially there has been some uh, pushback, if you if you want to call it, where they leaked some set pictures of Taskmaster when he's in this like blue costume and you get the, all the people going, ah. but I have faith in MCU. They usually do things right. You never know what CGI or what else is going to be added to it. So Taskmaster, I've seen it heat up before, come back down. You see it a lot. Especially when he shows up in animated series. He's in Black Widow. But what do you think about Taskmaster? I love this pick. I, like most people, am a Taskmaster fan. Um, I think that the reason why, like you mentioned, that this book has gone up before is really because people have always kind of gravitated to this character. Um, he's always kind of been one of the more popular villains. The problem is he's never had that real adaptation. The animated uh, shows, some of the Spider-Man shows, we've seen him fight Deadpool. Those have been kind of the only taste we've gotten. And honestly, those shows are skewed towards a younger audience. So that was really just us grasping at straws. This is going to be the first opportunity to get them on the big screen. And I think that's why people are so disappointed by those set images, because people are so invested, not necessarily financially, but just emotionally as fans and collectors. But I 100% agree with you. I think if anybody wants to sell me their Taskmaster's cheap because of those pictures, let me know, because that's not going to slow me down. The reality of the situation is if you go back and look at set pictures of, say, the Flash TV show before it came out, that show looked like it was going to be the cheapest, stupidest looking thing on TV. Or Titans. And if you watch the Titans right, the same way. Oh, man, that might have been even worse. And then if you, if you watch like the Flash on the CW, I, they do the Flash right. They did it better than the Justice League movie did it. So I, with the way movie magic is, like you mentioned, with CGI and so many of these effects, 
you have to kind of trust the people who are professionals at it. If we see them in the big screen and they, they mess it up, that's different. But I'm going to have faith in the MCU, like you said. Um, I'm going to have faith that they're going to get it right. They've gotten every movie release right in like the last, I'd say, six or seven years. They're on a streak. And I think it's going to continue. And I don't think they're going to mess up Taskmaster. Um, now, to talk about the books. 196, Avengers 196. That's uh, the obvious market named first appearance. Um, most of you know, but, I, you know, we get new people all the time. So I want to bring this up is that, um, you know, there is also 195 where Taskmaster actually appears on the last page. Um, it's one of those books where, in my opinion, it's a first appearance, but the market has called it a cameo. So we got to kind of roll with it. But I think 195 is still a stealth buy. I still find those ones in long boxes where dealers aren't kind of aware. So I think that's a book to keep an eye out for. Um, also, there's like there's some great Taskmaster cover appearances in the Deadpool run, in the Ant-Man run. And those are characters where Taskmaster tends to kind of line up with and fight which also will be interesting to see if we get that at some point in the MCU, Taskmaster versus Deadpool. I definitely think we'll end up getting Taskmaster versus Ant-Man at some point. I have to believe that. Um, and also, there's a Marvel team-up issue uh, featuring Ant-Man and Taskmaster, which is a very early appearance, which is one to keep an eye on, as well as Avengers 223, which has that famous Hawkeye shooting Ant-Man on the bow, which we got to see actually play out in Avengers. That is a versus Taskmaster issue. And then because I'm the kind of guy where I've got my hands in a little bit of everything, I'm going to bring up something else for you since, you know, it's just Taskmaster on the hot list. There's some other collectibles featuring Taskmaster that are massively undervalued. His Marvel Legends action figure currently goes under retail price on eBay a lot of times, regularly going off for about $16, $17. I think this is a great buy right now as most like mainstream non-hardcore comic fans aren't even aware he's showing up in Black Widow and don't even understand yet how cool this character is. Another great buy is the Funko Pop exclusive of Taskmaster that came out with uh, from Walgreens. Now, the Walgreens exclusives, they tend to be like pretty solidly produced. There's a lot of them. So it takes a while for them to heat up. But we've seen this before with movies. They will undoubtedly release a Funko series that will have all of the characters from the movie. And if people gravitate to Taskmaster, and then once they realize that's not the first Funko Taskmaster, then they're going to want to go back and get that first one. It's, it's happened time and time again with Disney properties, with Marvel and DC properties. And it's a great way to make money. And you can find these Taskmasters sometimes at still at Walgreens for regular price, $8.99, $9.99. But even if you go on eBay, you're only paying an upcharge to about $15, $16 shipped. I think that is a great buy. So be on the lookout for that Taskmaster stuff. Be on the lookout for that off the beaten path stuff because 196 is red hot right now. You used to be able to find that book cheap all the time in mid grade. And you're starting to see that book creep up over the hundred dollar threshold up in close to $200. And I don't think that that's going to slow down. If they do him right in the movies, his potential is unlimited. I only hope that they don't ruin him by having him kind of be a one-off villain appearance. I really hope that he's a villain who's going to stick around and may show up in other movies. Yeah. Like, uh, um, Jamie Foxx's Electro. <laughs> right, right. Everyone got excited for that, and that wasn't going to last. Schwarzenegger's Mr. Freeze. So our next hot pick this week comes from Cool Mike Morello, who writes the cover tunes article on comicbookinvest.com. So make sure you check that out as well. But right now, check out his hot pick. Hey, everybody. Mike Morello from CBSI's Cover Tunes with my hot pick for the week. Um, and this week, I am really excited about the hot pick it is Sandman. Um, you may remember a couple of weeks back I talked about uh, the hotness of all things Bronze Age horror and unfortunately the coldness of all things Vertigo with DC canceling the Vertigo line. And Of course we talked about hoping that some of those characters would be picked up in other titles or possibly on television shows and lo and behold we look like we have some great news with Netflix picking up Sandman. Man, I've been waiting for this since I was like 12, 13, 14 years old. I have read Sandman since then, and it is literally the only run of comics I kept when I dumped out the first time out of comics, um, and I really, really am excited. If you're interested in some of those old Bronze Age uh, titles and numbers that uh, tie into Sandman, check out one of my old Cover Tunes articles, number 29, 
keys that don't sell like keys. It's from last October, and that'll go through characters like Merv Pumpkinhead, Matthew the Raven, Kane, Abel, Eve, uh, Lucy and the Librarian, um, and a few others. So there's that set, but there's also the stuff from the main Sandman title, and that's what I really want to talk about today, because those are getting really hot really quickly, um, and you're going to want to grab those now before they get out of control. Obviously, you got your first one here, which is Sandman number one, which everyone really needs to have. That's the first full appearance of Dream um, or Morpheus or the Sandman, whatever you want to call him. Um, you've got number four, which is the first Lucifer, um, and that's really important because I think there's going to possibly be a tie-in now. If they're both going to be on Netflix, I definitely see a tie-in happening, and this book's going to get even hotter than it is now. You've got a fan favorite with Sandman number eight, first appearance of Death. And be aware, there's a really, really rare editorial variant of this with an editorial on the front page. So keep your eye out for that. But even still, the regular issue is awesome with a really great cover as well. Um, then you got number 10, which is sort of um, a double hit. You get in number 10, Despair and Desire in this issue. So you get two of the endless there. Um, and then in 21, you get Delirium, first appearance of Delirium. In 22, a book that's gotten really hot and is getting, it's going to get even hotter is the first appearance of Daniel and Mazikeen. And um, so keep your eye on that one. And then the last in the Sandman line for the endless first appearances is Destruction in number 41. Um, and if you've been keeping count, there are seven endless, but I've only gone through six books. The seventh one appears in Weird Mystery Tales number one, and that is Destiny. Destiny is a much older DC character that Neil Gaiman picked up on and used as one of the endless. But the real ghost, and the one I really hope everyone will try to go out and find, um, is the first cameo or first preview appearance of Sandman or Morpheus or, uh, or Dream, whatever you want to call him, which is this, DC Direct Currents number 10. And this thing is a ghost. It's really hard to find. If you'll notice, a lot of them have these stamps from stores that gave them away. Um, hopefully you can find one like this one that doesn't have the stamp on it. Um, but either way, it's so rare that, I mean, if you find it, you find it. So that's, uh, that's the, that's the, the big stuff. There's a lot of other minor keys as well. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to all these popping and getting uh, expensive so that we can either get them, hold them and love them or, or flip them if that's your thing. So that's my hot pick for the week. Thanks a lot for listening guys. Have a great week. So there we have Mike's pick before we discuss this pick, Topher. The mass speculator himself, he has a pick that was similar, so this week we decided to pair them together, and let's see what Topher has to say. You know what's hot this week? Just the idea of a DC Netflix deal. You thought the Dark Horse thing was big? They have a lock something up with DC, speculator heads are gonna explode. Think of the possibilities. A major bummer cartoon, a Sea Guy special, we three finally... Not to mention all the superhero shows DC could not cancel right away. All I know is DC needs something like this. Fat Stick and Marvel Zombie ripoffs can only keep you afloat for so long, and Scott Snyder ain't coming to help. He's knee-deep in Grant Morrison's swimming pool and he can't get out. Come on, DC. You have an endless catalog of stuff to force down the flick's throat. All you need to do now is fire everyone who runs anything, hire competent people, and get the deal done. So there we have it, Jack. We have Mike's pick talking about Sandman and Netflix. DC Vertigo, as he discussed, Vertigo got canceled. But there's a plus to it. You're seeing those characters come to life in a Netflix deal. And then Topher speaks a little bit broader on the subject, talking about wanting to see more DC titles come to Netflix. What do you think about this pick? Or the, what do you think about these picks, Jack? I love these picks. And we talked about it on, on the CBSI Bolo show. We talked about it also right here on the Hot and Cold show when Vertigo was announced that they were closing. Both you and I were optimistic that it, it really wasn't going to negatively affect the Vertigo brands in and of themselves because they weren't necessarily going to throw those away. We even saw an announcement today of a new Hellblazer series coming up under the Sandman universe. So I think that what they're going to do is package all of these characters together. So Mike talked about the Sandman deal at Netflix. That is so huge. Sandman fans have been looking for this adaptation for a long time. Neil Gaiman, I know, has been looking to do this for a long time. Now, it's important to note when you're going out buying first appearances that th they've already put out that the first season is going to be the prologue and then the first arc. Now, we don't know what it's going to happen beyond that. It kind of depends on the popularity. So if you're looking to invest, I think the best investment is Sandman number one. I was at 
uh, Heroes Con a few weeks back, and I was shocked at how cheap those had gotten just a couple weeks ago. That you know they would gotten down to thirty, forty dollars at some booths. That was a solid hundred to hundred and fifty dollar book years ago, and I think it can easily return back there and stay there. Um, I do think I do agree that the issue number four, the first appearance of Lucifer, that's a solid buy. We're coming into the last season of Lucifer on Netflix. But Tom Ellis has played this character beautifully. And I think he reminds me of the way that Matt Ryan has played Constantine on the TV shows. I don't think Warner Brothers wants to let these guys go. And I could see Constantine coming to Netflix. And I'm going to bring up another thing. The DC app has done an amazing job with TV shows. Titans was better than expected. And if you're watching Swamp Thing right now, it's an amazing show. Now, everybody's going to bring up that Swamp Thing got canceled. But again, guys, I'm a Carolina boy. I live in South Carolina. And one thing that we know down here is that the state of North Carolina is broke. And they're having all kinds of budget trouble. And one of the things that they did, and we talked about this on the show, is they took away an $85 million tax credit that they had given Warner Brothers. That was allowing them to shoot that show as expensive as it is in North Carolina. The only other place where they had the kind of swamp land to shoot that show is Louisiana. And they said that the show would cost them $65 million more. Netflix executives made a joke about, hey, call us. And that was on Twitter right when this whole thing happened. I believe that's going to happen. I think Swamp Thing is going to end up on Netflix. And you'll end up having Constantine, Swamp Thing, Sandman, and end up building a Vertigo universe right there on Netflix. Now, I'm not saying that's a guarantee. That's just my gut feeling. I think that's where it's going to end up going. And if you ask me why, I think the biggest reason is the Disney Plus app. It's coming. It's going to be huge. And it's going to have so much superhero content that Netflix is going to have to compete. And I don't know that Dark Horse is enough. I don't know if these indie image titles that they're picking up are enough. I think they're great. But having something like DC Comics in your back pocket is a major coup. But I would caution people. I don't think you're going to see a Superman show on Netflix. I don't think you're going to see a Batman show on Netflix. I think if those kind of shows happen, they're going to happen on the DC app. I don't think DC is regu- ready to abandon that app. They put too much money into that. It hasn't reached profitability. Uh, it would be a major bad look for them to scrap it already. So I definitely think that's something to to keep an eye out for. And also remember that, a- that Warner Brothers just did a deal with HBO and HBO Max to bring streaming service for Warner Brothers products, including that of Watchmen, which begins on HBO this year. So – DC is kind of all over the place with what they're doing with streaming services. And I think that really is going to play into Netflix's favor because DC just wants to get their products out. They haven't had the success that Marvel's had. And we got to realize the big two are in constant competition. And I think the winners of this whole thing is going to be us speculators and collectors because we're going to have an opportunity to get books and see them pop. If you were investing in Sandman Universe a couple weeks ago, you are sitting on some money right now. So these are two great picks from two different perspectives, and I like them both. Right, and I was at, fir- at first I was going to say, "Hey, well, why would Netflix invest in Warner Brothers DC titles when they just got smacked in the face with Marvel titles?" Because Marvel opened that Disney Plus app. Well, kind of answered my own question thinking about it because DC already has an app, and it's not very good. So the, I right. think there's a lower risk there that they would they would possibly do that. DC wants to add content to that app, but they have to do it at a rate that's profitable. So and I, I think that they want to move faster than that app is going to allow them to move. And I think that's where Netflix will come in and help them. And Netflix can also take some of these fringe properties. Let's be honest. Sandman's great, but Sandman wasn't something I was – if I was going to create the next show for the DC app, I don't think Sandman's where I would go. But it, but it kind of fits perfectly with Netflix – because I don't think that the caped superhero shows will ever do as well on Netflix as shows that appeal to kind of a wider non-comic book um, kind of fandom, similar to the way Umbrella Academy or Stranger Things, which isn't a truly comic book property but kind of fits in the same genre, have done. And and Stranger Things just broke another streaming record for Netflix. So I I think that's what they're looking for, and I think Sam Man provides that opportunity. Right. So speaking about all this, MCU, DCU, Netflix – I want to give a bolo out to you guys. If you have Amazon Prime video, check out Rise of the Superhero on Amazon Prime. Fantastic little documentary starting with how superhero movies started and where it is today with the MCU, DCU, and everything. I watched that over the weekend. It's about two hours long, but it's a great video. It's on Amazon Prime, so definitely check that out. And with that, 
we are going to move into the next pick on the hot list. And this one comes from Dollar Bin Digging article writer Peter Renna. So, what's going on, everybody? Uh, this week, my hot pick would have to be Marvel's later printings. Uh, there's various uh, second, third, and even fourth prints that have heated up lately. I was never a big fan of them, but uh, I've slowly started to change my tune a little bit. I mean, recently we know the Silver Surfer Black second print got hot. This is, you know, $20 book now. Venom number three, the third print, no cover. This is, you know, 20 25 bucks now. Uh, I was lucky enough to find a couple copies of this Daredevil 2 second print just the other day, and this is a $25, $30 book now. And uh, then one I don't have is that Thanos 15 that I wrote about in a, my uh, Usual Suspects article a uh, week back. That uh, is a $20, you know, $20 book as well, that Silver Surfer cover. So these uh, second, third, fourth prints, they're uh, heating up. Um, and you know what? I like them. New art. Uh, long term, I don't know where they're going to stand. Will they be, you know, that Ms. Marvel second print cover? Not, probably not. But uh, they still are nice little books to hold. So uh, that's what I think is hot this week. So, Jack, Marvel second printing covers. If we were to talk about this, say, what, five years ago, we would be talking about how cold they are because every Marvel second, third, fourth printing we've talked about on the Bolo Show, we've talked about in other videos, same freaking cover, just a different, like, color bar. And that's how you tell the printing outside of like that Spider-Verse design variant they did with Spider-Gwen, who's now Ghost Spider. But what do you think about Peter's pick? Well, you know, other than some of the, the cartoon properties that we talked about earlier, the biggest thing I've been an advocate for is these late printings. I think they get slept on. You mentioned Spider-Gwen. I still sit back and say with the popularity of Spider-Gwen, second, third, fourth, fifth print, those are slept on books. Same with, um, you know, like Camilla Khan's Marvel Point One second print and um, Riri Williams is another one whose later printings are worth nothing. They go for nothing. And I think that those are stealth buys as these characters get bigger. But Marvel, about a year ago, figured something out. We can reuse this interior artwork. We don't have to pay for new artwork. We don't have to pay the artist new money. And it gives a fresh cover that those of us in the community, and you know you're out there, who don't ever read a comic book, you're just buying them for the covers and the collectability. For you, it's new cover art. You've never seen it before. But it also provides unique opportunities, like in with books like, um, as Peter mentioned, uh, Thanos uh, 15, the fourth print, to take a key moment in the book, a key first appearance, and put it on the cover. Another one that comes to mind is Avengers 682, which I, I have a hard time not saying is the first appearance of Immortal Hulk, since it says Immortal Hulk, and there he is. But... He's featured on the cover of that book, and I think that creates a unique collectible. And another pick that I like that Peter mentioned is that Daredevil number two second printing. Um, that was a book that had been released, was kind of under the radar. Uh, people weren't talking about it, which is why people are now able to pick them up from time to time, because they were sitting on LCS shelves. And then as the popularity of the character Detective North became kind of increasingly in demand on the market, people started to realize, wait, there's the second print. He's on the cover and it's a first appearance. And suddenly the book skyrockets and we're seeing it sell for what it's selling for today. And I think that that is a trend that's gonna continue. But one thing that could really kind of pour cold water on this hot pick is what's going on with Marvel right now. Unfortunately, every single time Marvel gets something right, they seem to mess it up for themselves. So we as a community started jumping on board these second prints putting in larger orders for them. Um, LCS has started putting in larger order for, for them. And now we've seen trends continue like incentive variants for late prints, which I don't hate, but I don't love. I do. Either. I do, Mox. I do. <laughs> I hate those. I will come out and tell you those incentive second printings and later printings. Not a fan, but please continue. See, it, the books themselves, I don't have a problem with. What we're seeing is these dealers who, they tend to be like the internet-based dealers. They're not like your local LCS guys. Um, they buy up large quantities of these books. They sell the incentive variant at a, you know, inflated price. And then the actual late printing book in and of itself becomes worthless. The best example of that is Mortal Hulk 16. You can't give away the Immortal Hulk 16 second print. The 16 second print incentive, now that's something people want, but nobody wants that regular book. And I think you're going to continue to see that as these incentives are created. I, so like I said, I don't, I don't hate the concept. I hate the way the market has gone about that. 
But what I really don't like is Marvel opening up these late printings for retailer exclusive variants. Now, obviously, Brian and I, we're producers of retailer exclusive variants through CBSI. I'm not hating on retailer exclusive variants altogether, but you got to understand the way retailer exclusives work. You have to have kind of a lag time between when you put your order in and when the book releases so that you can get your cover art together. You can get it finalized. You can get it approved by all the proper people. When you're doing these late printings, they're done quickly. So you can't really do a whole lot. So what has ended up happening is stores are going and grabbing old artwork from artists and printing that up as their exclusive covers. And while some of the artwork has been good, a lot of it, there's a reason that that given artist didn't use that artwork five, six, seven years ago, because it just doesn't stack up to what they're currently producing. So Brian and I talked about this when we first started doing the variant program. We don't want to just release a book just to release a book. If we release a book, we want it to be a unique collectible. We want it to be something that whether it pops in the secondary market or not, you can be proud to own in your collection. You don't feel like it's just another also ran book. And I think that that's happening a lot with those books. And then to tie that into the incentives. So now if I'm a store variant producer and I'm producing 3000 store variants, well, now again, you're getting a stack of one in 25 variants, which then you're dumping on the market and you're killing the book altogether. So Marvel needs to, at some point, put a governor on this thing and say, you know what? We've taken enough out of this because what's going to end up happening is buyers are going to end up rejecting these books. They're going to become cold again. And then we've messed it all up. And you've got and it's one of those things that Marvel's doing right over DC because I hang this up all the time. DC is lazy with the late printings and they just color the book red or something like that. And you're not getting a unique collectible. And they have such great artists on their stable of, uh, of talent that it, it would be easy for them to do another B cover or something like that. But that's something to keep an eye out for. I love late printings. I think there's some great ones out there in the market. But I don't like the trend in late printings. I wanted everyone to get on board with them. I didn't want everyone to get on board this way. When I said I wanted people to get on board with them, I meant you, the speculator, the buyer, the collector, not these corporate companies who then are going to be greedy and mess it up. And that's what we're seeing. Yeah. I think some of it comes down to, I mean, we can't, can't push all the blame because I think we also reap what we sow. And if yep. the publisher thinks, hey, this is what they're going to want, and then this, uh, speculators or however you want and start buying it up that, that that creates that trend and they keep doing it so yeah we, we might not like it but we also got to take the good with the bad if you're going to speculate they're going to try to cater to all the demographics so we might not like it but we're also part of the reason why it's there to exist i, I believe but all good points and well and then i i think it's it's kind of like one thing that gets missed in the whole process is the real reason for late printings is when a book gets popular and it sells out yeah. is to create a book so that a reader can come pick it up. So similarly to the way I talked about how I missed out on Walking Dead 193, I don't really care what the second print goes for. I want to just buy it to read it. And, you know, I think that that still isn't lost. The value of getting those books into people's hands. The problem is we're just creating too many of those books now. So now there's that abundance of books. But similar to when I did my retailer rant with Walking Dead 193, if you're out there at Simpleman's Comics Family and you hate what you're seeing with late printings, the biggest way that you can vote and let Marvel know how you feel is with your wallet. Don't buy. It's not, it's not worth you making 15 bucks on an incentive if it's just going to continue to tank the market. There's plenty of other plays where you can go and make some money. Watch the CBSI Bolo Show. Watch the Hot Cold Show. We're going to give you plenty of tips on books you can make money on without having to jump on these cash grabs that are ultimately hurting us as a whole. And we're all guilty of it. I've done it. I jumped in on Immortal Hulk 16. I'm not singling you out or saying I'm better or anything like that. But I think that I stopped after that book. I talked to Andy Tomberlin from the Indie Spotlight series who felt the same way. He jumped in on the first couple and then said, no mas, we got, I can't play this game because they're releasing more and more and more of them. It was one thing when it was Immortal Hulk 16, Immortal Hulk 2 and Major X number one. And it was like, ah, that's a lot, but those are all good books. Now it's everything's getting it. So you vote with your wallet. If you pass on it, retailers will get stuck with them, which is unfortunate. And But then they'll move on to something else. Right. And apparently Immortal Hulk 16 second print did something good because you see all those other covers that are coming out like 
was there five or six different comics now with that same type cover, like Moon Knight and that's... right in September. In September, there will be B variants. I believe they're cover price right. B variants that will. Be, they're called Immortal variants that fe- feature that wraparound. So it's real funny because people kind of ragged on that Joe Bennett cover, but obviously Marvel saw the popularity of it and they're creating more. And I will say some of the ones that they're creating are pretty nice. I pre-ordered them. I just didn't order a lot, just a couple. Test the market out on them. That's Peter Renner's pick. We're going to move right on into the Hot 10 author himself, Ben Stein, and Tales from the Flipside member. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Ben S., writer of the Hot 10 on comicbookinvest.com. My hot pick this week are foreign Bronze Age books, specifically uh, the Amazing Spider-Man out-of-continuity books that usually feature Gwen Stacy, uh, where she's still alive, these books are, they're going for crazy uh, dollars, thousands in some cases. Uh, I've never actually seen any of these in person, but you see them pop up on eBay every once in a while. It's hard to find them because they're Spanish and you don't really know exactly how they're listed on eBay. Um, I have a feeling that once these actually do make it into uh, mainstream American comic book collecting, um, we might see some... Uh, uh, you know, some higher grades pop up every once in a while. Most of these are not in great shape. Um, but John Z's been bringing these up on uh, on our Tales from the Flipside podcast for months. Um, we've had a couple shows about it um, where he's brought people in who are, you know, experts at thinking, of, you know, coming up with, uh, you know, what these books are actually worth. Um, but anyways, that's my hot pick this week. Um, foreign variants. So there we have it, Jack. Ben S., as he said himself in the video, his pick is Bronze Bronze Age foreign variants, specifically the Spidey foreign variants, or specifically the Spidey foreign variants. He touched on those a lot. But what do you think about this pick, Jack? Well, I love this pick. And if you're not familiar with these uh, Spidey Mexican variants that Ben's talking about, in Mexico, they were not on board with the death of Gwen Stacy. So they continued the storyline with Gwen Stacy alive instead of being dead. So there's all of these issues that were only released in Mexico telling all of these stories where Gwen Stacy continues as a character in the, in the Spider-Verse. And this is a really unique collectible that Americans are just kind of becoming aware of and finding out. And as Ben mentioned, most of them come back in terrible condition. So we're not seeing high grades. And it is tough to track them on eBay. You, um, we, Tales from the flip side, if you guys are not following them if you're not subscribed to them then you know we absolutely want to advocate you do that those guys were one of the first people i have ever heard talking about these issues no they were the first and they've dedicated entire episodes to talking about foreign variants they brought experts on foreign variants on and now the market is responding we're seeing these prices going absolutely insane they've showed up on the hot 10. if you're familiar with watching the hot 10 video I had Comic Tom from the Hot 10 texting me look because he was looking for a specific book and he was shocked at what Ben was reporting the sales were. And it's not that he didn't believe me, but he wanted me to prove that the sale price that we had quoted was correct. And when I sent him the link that Ben Stein had sent me, it was a situation where Tom had been searching for one thing in the eBay listings and the listing was listing completely different. And that's where you've got the difficulty with the language barrier. Some of these books are listed in their language, whether it's Spanish or the German variants that are becoming popular, Italian variants that are popular. So you may have to search that. Some people are saying Amazing Spider-Man 300 Italian variant. So you get that. You're getting them listed all different ways and they're really tough to track and really tough to find. So these Mexican variants, they are the, that especially the ones that appear with the Gwen Stacy during that time period, those are the cream of the crop. But there's a lot of variants that are still under the radar. It's amazing to me how much like Fantastic Four 52, the first appearance of Black Panther, or ASM 300 in other countries don't command nearly the money that they would in America. And now, granted, these books were released a couple years later, um, so you can argue, well, it's not really a first appearance, but it is to you if you live in those countries. And a lot of us in the speculation community have been predicting for a long time. I remember talking about this within CBSI circles a good seven, eight years ago, that we kind of saw this trend happening, that this was going to be something that people would want because so many people aren't even familiar with it. When you go to shows, you don't see any booths that have like a, a, a real selection of foreign variants. You may find one here. You may find one there. 
but you're not seeing a selection at, at a store at LCS. You're not seeing a selection at a, a um, show or a convention. And I think that that is something that becomes difficult. And it's mostly because they're not easy to buy. They're not easy to find. And when you do find them, they tend to be in absolutely terrible condition. So I think that it's a market that we haven't yet even scratched the surface of. Uh, it's one I like. Uh, especially I'm an Italian American. I kind of think it's cool. The idea of owning keys from Italy. I think that that kind of is something I can relate to. And I think there's a lot of people out there like that. And I think that's where comic Tom who's Hispanic. I think that's where he comes from with it. I think he, he likes any comic that's Spanish language. He thinks that's cool. His dad reads them uh, comic pops. If you're on Instagram, uh, he's also on the YouTube channel. So I think people can relate to him, but then even if you're not, you don't have that cultural tie-in, there's still the fact that, you know, these are just unique collectibles. If you're the guy who feels like, man, I've, I've got it all Venom. I've got everything Venom that's ever been released. I'm telling you, there's foreign releases that you haven't seen. So be on the lookout for these foreign releases. Um, I've seen Japanese books. I've seen German books. I've seen Italian books. I've seen books from the UK, obviously. That's a, you know, we know those with the Pence variants and whatnot. Um, we've seen books from Mexico and who knows what books we haven't unearthed yet. And even these modern books that Panay is putting out overseas in Europe, they're not easily accessible to us American collectors. So I even wonder some of these more modern books, the keys, what is going to happen to them down the road? And will there be this demand? And the difference with that is because we're dealing with the modern era, a lot of those are going to be in better condition. So what is going to happen with grading and so on and so forth it's really unlimited so it's going to be something to pay attention to and if you're not up on it if you haven't been watching it i suggest you go to the tales from the flip side uh channel subscribe but check out that foreign comics episode you're going to get so much information in that hour plus period too much so make sure you take notes and start checking these things out because some stealth buys to be had out there just based on auction titles and times and the fact that sometimes they get listed from other countries and people aren't aware of our time zones and things like that. So there's a lot of plays to be had out there and I think it's a market that's only going to grow. Right. So there we have it. The Rosetta Stone of comic books. <laughs> but also, you said if you search eBay for like Amazing Spider-Man Italian variant, you're kind of doing it wrong because most of the search listings that are going to come up are people that are aware of what they have. Now, if you search for it from the actual title or if you go to the eBay Italy sites or one of those, you know, those other country sites, there's a there's a exchange rate difference. But you kind of might find something for a better price, wouldn't you think, Jack, than if you say Italian variant? Oh. Absolutely. That's a, that's a major pro tip that you just yeah. gave right there because it's, it's absolutely true. If you search Italian variant, the only thing you're going to get is guys like you and me reselling these books that we found. Um, but make sure you look up what these titles actually are in their language and don't be afraid to buy from eBay's marketplace in other countries, especially these large countries like Mexico and um, you know Germany and Italy. The same rules apply for them. You will have to deal with the shipping and the exchange rate, but you can get around that. And these are unique collectibles that you can't find anywhere else. And truly, we don't know the scarcity of them. We don't know. And the population reports are so minuscule if they exist at all. So it's worth that risk and, and that investment. Um, the search engine thing is definitely your biggest obstacle, yeah. obstacle for sure. But that's a great point that Brian made. You're kind of wasting your time even typing in that word variant. Yeah. If somebody puts a variant, then they're essentially a dealer and they know what they have. Yeah. And with that, is that my key transition phrase? I forget. Yeah. With that being said. And with that being said, that wraps up the hot list portion of the show and we're going to roll right into the cold list right now, starting with Reading Pile author Dan Piercy. Cold pick. Look at these books, huh? Look at them. Huh? They's beautiful, ain't they? They's beautiful. This is Spawn 298. Didn't do too well, did it? Nah. Still cool cover, so. Cold pick of the week. See ya. So there it is, Jack. What do you think of Dan's pick? Well, you know, Dan's pick hurts my heart a little bit because you know I love Spawn. And I was really excited for the road to 300. 
But I really have to look at this, honestly, take a step back and say, you know what? He's not wrong. The road to 300 kind of lost its steam, even with me. Um, and there's so much going on in the marketplace right now, um, especially fandoms that I enjoy. So like Power Rangers and Necessary Evil storyline, what's going on with TMNT, which we already talked about, the upcoming G.I. Joe Snake Eyes saga. These are things that have kind of taken my attention. I think that where Todd McFarlane made his mistake here is when you go back to his announcement of, of the road to 300 and everybody keeps talking about the road to 300. I don't even think 300 is the term 301 is that record breaker. So that's the one I almost say, don't sleep on. If there was one that could turn this, it would be 301. But he talked about not making a million covers, not doing a bunch of incentives. And essentially that's exactly what he did. 298 and 299, they're cool. They're, 298 and 299, they're cool homages. I love the look of the book. I really don't have anything bad to say about it. It's just that it, it hasn't picked up any buzz. I think the only people buying it are people buying it for the cover homages. I don't think there's a solid reader base going on right now. I don't think people are heavily invested in the story. And that's where I think Todd is missing his mark. And just like my love for Rob Liefeld, my love for Todd McFarlane far exceeds that. He is the Todd father. But I, at the same point, you know, family has to let family know when we made a mistake. And it, you're looking at like the all the way from cover A to cover K for 300. You're looking at incentives. And don't get me wrong, some cool artists excited about J. Scott Campbell, the return of Greg Capullo. All of that's exciting. But I don't know about you, Brian. For me, when I'm looking at a solicit, when there's too many covers – I just get turned off to the whole thing because it puts me in a position to have to either pick and choose what cover I think is going to be popular or over order trying to order all of the different covers. I feel much more comfortable on a book like Canto where there's one cover and an incentive and I know, okay, I believe in this book, so I'm going to load up. But when you get these choices of these like regular cover price variants, and you see this a lot with like Marvel, War of Realms is a prime example. When it just gets – overly done it, it, it kind of just it makes it tough for any of the books to pop and i think that that is a trend we have seen i wish todd would have avoided that and kept it really simple for 300 but i can't blame him because it's this monumental moment and this opportunity for him to you know really make some money and, and put a book out that hits in the market but i think dan's not wrong i, I think it's gonna miss a bit i don't at least i don't think it's gonna hit what it could Another thing that really hurts this is we were supposed to have a Spawn movie like in production by now. Now Todd's saying that if he doesn't get his script approved, because his script's been rejected a few times from the movie studio. If he doesn't get his script approved the way he wants it soon, he's just going to pull out of the project. And we may lose all of that hype that we've built for Spawn over the last year. Spawn has been a mover. If you haven't been paying attention, you know, Spawn back issues have been selling for record prices. Um, Todd was supposed to spin off uh, the character – Misery, um, who is Al Simmons's widow's daughter with his old partner, um, who has grown up by now, and she was supposed to get her own series. Um, I was heavily investing in Spawn number three for that reason, and then now it's just radio silence on what's going on with that. And I think Todd has kind of lost all momentum with Spawn right now. now of course, I'm a positive speculator, so I believe you can get it back but it's going to be hard. Um, I think this was their best opportunity. And I, it's kind of early to say that it's a true cold pick because we haven't quite hit 300 yet. We haven't hit 301 yet, but I think Dan's right. I think it's missing the mark. And I think that what he pointed out about 298, 299, I think that um, that trend will probably continue. And I don't think it'll be difficult to get 300 at your LCS. And another thing to note is that book's a 799 cover price. These 799 cover price books that companies keep putting out are not working. People don't want to spend that much money. And if they do, they're certainly not trying to buy five covers at $8. You're taking too much of the consumer's money on release day. And you're hurting all of the other creators who, you know, they're not, a, if people go hard on your book, they can't buy other books. It's just a bad idea. It hasn't proven to work out in the past. So yeah, you make a lot of good points and we're going to keep moving on right now. We're going to go into the next cold pick and it's from Peter Renna. 
So, my uh, cold pick this week is going to be another, I don't really understand why it's cold, we should be seeing a little bit more action on these books, and that would be Black Hammer. Uh, got optioned in the last year, and we know there's probably going to be a movie, TV, maybe both, coming, and uh, there's a lot of great stories and great characters in there. So, the number one's still selling pretty steady, it's probably like a $20 book, but uh, there's other books in the run, like uh, number eight here, the uh, first appearance of... Uh, Dr. Sherlock Frankenstein got his own miniseries. Like, that's something that could be a few episodes of a TV show. Who knows? These things could heat up. There's a lot of first appearances, and there's a lot of characters in that universe, and there's a lot of different ways they could go. And, again, you know, a lot of these books aren't costing you a lot, but, you know, nobody's talking about them, so, you know, these things might be able to get picked up on the cheap right now. Uh, a lot of different series, but the, it's good stuff. So, whether, you know, they go up, they don't, they're good reads, but I still think they might be a little bit cold, but uh, they have a chance to heat up down the line. All right? Thanks. So there it is, Jack. Peter's talking Black Hammer being cold. To me, I've seen it go up and then go back down again, especially in the issue number one, um, especially the Jeff Lemire variants. But we also had Black Hammer Justice League that debuted today. So it's anxious to see how that is recepted. But what do you think about this pick? Well, you know, Brian, I think this is a good pick. I think this pick is an example of why this show works. And I'll also say one of the things that I'm the proudest of um, that we do on Simple Men's Comics is we don't just talk about the books. We talk about speculator tendencies, speculator trends. And we try to give as much advice to the Simple Men's Comics family about how to navigate these markets. This is a prime example. We talk all the time about the lack of patience in the market and how you can use that to your advantage. So a prime example of this is Black Hammer. On our debut episode... Uh, let me start that again so I wasn't coughing in the beginning. On our on our debut episode, Dan Piercy brought this book as a hot pick. And this was coming right off the announcement that Legendary Pictures had picked up Black Hammer, that they were looking to do TV shows and movies, which is a very unique option, something we haven't seen. And this is what Jeff Lemire has been building towards by having this universe and all of these spin-off books and all of these kind of one shots and different things that brought in all of these different characters and time periods. Um, the potential for Black Hammer is really unlimited. We've talked a lot within CBSI circles about this all the way up to CB the CBSI owner, Ben C. Um, and we've been having these conversations about how it's gonna really be interesting to see how the Black Hammer thing plays out. But what did we see once that announcement got made? Everyone jumped on, all the cheap copies got bought up Prices escalated, and we started to see record highs being set for Black Hammer. But now, we're a good two months later, and what has happened? These prices have fallen back. Now, they haven't fallen back to their original place, of course, but they've fallen considerably less than where they were. I think these are all good plays. There's a, And this is a unique property where there's a lot of first appearances outside of that issue number one. You're kind of like shortchanging yourself just going for that issue number one because that's what Lemire has done here. He has built a universe and it spans time periods. So it's one of those things where this series and this universe has a lot of potential. What Legendary Pictures ends up doing with this, we're going to have to wait and see. But because this is so very much in play, this is a cold pick that Brian and I talk about. We like the cold picks a lot of times better than the hot picks because there's opportunity in cold picks. Hot picks are books you should get maybe selling. Cold picks are books that you should look at maybe buying. And I think Black Hammer is a prime example of a book you should be looking at to buy right now. Um, and another book person who's not featured this week but is usually right here with us on the Hot and Cold Show the mighty Mel V himself, Mel Vaughn, he talked on his um, easel of elevation recently about a Black Hammer one shot that was really more of just kind of like a book that featured kind of like imaging and whatnot. But there were some first appearances in that. So there's a lot of these books out there that people need to pay attention to that are going completely under the radar because we just don't know yet where – they're going to go with Black Hammer. So be on the lookout for Black Hammer releases. I think Black Hammer number one has the potential to be Umbrella Academy number one, um, that free comic book day issue. But, you know, I think it even better because it's not a free comic book day issue. But I think it, that I think Black Hammer has that level of popularity as a possibility. It all just depends on how, whether it's movie, TV show, combination of both, how that gets distributed. But I really think the public will enjoy this series as most of us what comic readers have. Right. And I will say that 
the following that Black Hammer does have is strong. It might be small, but it's strong. I had one guy probably about a year and a half ago who was from England who was looking for an issue number two. And I said, I have it. And I had it for sale for like cover. I mean, it was like four bucks. And he wanted it. And I said, hey, like shipping to England was like 20 bucks. He didn't care. He wanted it. Couldn't find that issue. So that fan base for that title, it's a, I read probably the first arc and have fallen off of it just because of so many comic books, too much to read. But I enjoyed those first two issues. And he creates that gorgeous universe within it. So there is a following for it. It might be cold at this time, but I think any more news that comes out, this will definitely heat up again, especially as stuff, if there's casting rumors, or not even rumors, but oh, yeah. casting announcements or anything like that, people start scrambling for this book because everyone's after the shiny object, and this just isn't shiny right now. But it'll come back around. Right, and we and right now we've got all we've got is the option in and of itself. We don't even have to get deep into casting. They haven't told us whether we're going to TV show, movie, what the deal is. By that, any sort of news at all featuring Black Hammer is going to pop these books again. So that would be a minor pop. Brian's dead right. We start getting some casting, especially if we get some major casting. And if you're familiar with legendary pictures, like really anything's in play. They do major, major motion pictures. So there's really no no actor or actress you could say is off the table and couldn't be in this. And then they do a lot with television, produce a lot of great television series. And I'm personally a fan of the idea of doing both simultaneously. I think that's cool. I think that hasn't been done. And I think that that could add a unique layer of speculation to these books that we haven't seen with other properties. Right. So, yes, thank you, Peter, for that pick. And we're going to go right into the next cold pick, which is from Mike Morello. Hey, everybody. Mike Morello from CBSI's Cover Tunes. Uh, it's cold pick time. This week I'm going with Modern DC Girls. A year ago, you probably remember there was a lot of hype surrounding all these characters um, in the hopes of a really good Birds of Prey movie or um, Gotham City Sirens movie or something of that nature. Um, and there was a ton of hype around Cassandra Kane's Batgirl, Kate Kane's Batwoman, uh, Renee Montoya's The Question, The Second Question, um, Oracle, all those books. And, and honestly, all but save maybe the Black Canary Oracle number one, um, which is still selling pretty well. The rest of them are all flat. Um, they're, I mean, mostly down to cover price or close, five, ten bucks maybe at the most. Um, you got books like uh, the 52 series, number seven, number nine, number 11, number 48. You got Batman 475. Uh, Batman 567, Legend of the Dark Knight 120, Suicide Squad 23. Man, those books, some of those books were up close to like $75, $85, $95 a year ago. Now they're all back down to like $10, $15. Um, so hopefully if you kept some of those, maybe they'll pop back up again when that Harley Quinn movie hits. Um, but uh, my my estimation is to just get rid of them now, save some space in your short boxes, um, and, and be done with them. Because I think they're cold, and they're cold for good. That's my pick for the week, guys. Thanks. Have a good one. It's cold pick time! Cold pick time! Mike Morello's cold pick. I don't know, Jack. I don't think he really gave enough examples to support why he thinks that's a cold pick. What do you think? I tell you, I think Mike is one of the most thorough guys we have on the show. And that's why he's so good at what he does. Um, this is a guy who knows his stuff. Now, I'm tracking Harley Quinn sales like most speculators, and um, Harley Quinn has seen more of these flows than almost any other character. Her popularity is immense, obviously, but she set records and then dropped back to reasonable levels. And it wasn't until Mike kind of pointed this out, and some of it's kind of common sense, but that a lot of these female characters have done that. And I, I think that's partially because DC really drove these characters out there. There was a lot of product released with these characters. Um, DC has also gone for that like pinup art style that's kind of been their their way of marketing women. Um, and you know I'm not trying to judge, but if you compare and contrast Marvel and DC and the way that they've marketed their female characters, all of the um, DC female characters, they kind of tend to be scantily clad dressed, buxom women drawn by men. Um, and I think when you have the characters being bought for those reasons, you're not always going to keep collectors' attention spans. While Marvel has created characters like Spider Gwen and Riri Williams, who are real women who connect with real women, who connect with a younger audience, and um, I think are 
more inclusive and better examples of what kind of like real people are like. Um, and again, that's just one man's opinion. Let us know, Simple Men's Comic Family, how you feel and if you agree about that. Um, I, I've been thinking about that a lot. I actually had a conversation today with Simple Men's Comics family member and Patreon member Sarah um, when we were talking about the female Ninja Turtle and the fact that, you know, she said she was glad they didn't overly sexualize her. And I completely agree. It's a character that I feel like my daughters can be excited about. And if you're familiar with the old Venus Turtle, that was a whole different thing because they actually made like turtle breasts on her, which is obviously a pretty silly thing to do. Um, but I think that has partially to do with it. But I think really the largest factor is just the lack of success. We've talked about this several times on the channel, but the lack of success DC movies have had. Katana could have been huge, but Suicide Squad kind of flopped. Um, and I think that that really played into that character largely um poison ivy hasn't really seen the light of day yet other than gotham and gotham didn't move spec whatsoever it was more of an elseworld kind of thing um so we haven't seen poison ivy I, before everybody jumps in the comments and go she was in a batman movie i'm not talking about those old junky batman movies um we're talking about you know at, shout out to michael keaton though i'm not, I'm not throwing him in there but I, we're talking about the current um you know, slate of DCU movies. We're talking about the crappy Joel Schumacher movies. <laughs> yeah, Although of course. Uma Thurman did play good Poison Ivy. She, she, she did actually. That was, if I'm being honest, now that I think about it, that was one of the bright spots of that movie. But, um, um, but yeah. So the reality of the situation is we haven't gotten like Poison Ivy the way we're, we could and the way we probably will in the future because obviously there's a lot of talk with like the Birds of Prey stuff coming out. Um, Harley and Ivy play off each other so well. If they can get a character to play Poison Ivy, who can play off Margaret Robbie, there's unlimited potential there. So these characters are down, but like we just talked about with Black Hammer, there's a lot of buying opportunities. Um, you know, Batman the Outsiders, that first appearance of Katana, that that was it, number 200. Yeah. Um, that was a hot book for a while. That's cooled off. Obviously, when you're talking Poison Ivy, you're talking more of a silver age key. So the prices are going to be a bit inflated, but there's a lot of variants and more modern plays you can get into for poison Ivy. If that's beyond your budget. Also low grade is better than no grade. All books raise when, a, when a character pops. So don't be afraid to grab those 2.0s and 3.0s and 4.0s just because, you know, it's not the ideal book that you want. Um, and then, I think Harley Quinn is another example. Harley Quinn is down just because it's been a while since she's been kind of in the mainstream. And let's be honest, the Harley Quinn, like actual modern series just has never gotten people's attention that in my opinion, they need to reboot that entire character and stop making it like a female Deadpool funny character and find a way to integrate her better into uh, more bat universe stories. The best I saw Harley Quinn depicted was by Tom King in the um, Heroes in Crisis storyline. The way they weaved Harley Quinn in and kind of had her be this like anti-hero, this bad guy who kind of wanted to be good and then got caught up in a situation. Um, when she would give her perspective, it, it kind of felt a bit more enlightened than what we tend to get from her own personal series. So I think that I would like to see more of that Harley in comics rather than the Harley that we've seen. Um, if I would say one more thing about Harley in modern comics, I would say be on the lookout for that upcoming Black Label series, Harleen. Um, Black Label's been on fire, and I'm kind of interested to see what they're going to do with Harley Quinn. So great pick again from Mike. But moving into the last cool pick tonight, we have Clint Jocelyn. Good afternoon, CBSI Nation. Clint Jocelyn coming to today with the cold pick of the week. And my cold pick of the week, unfortunately, I don't like to say this is Frank Miller books, uh, recent Frank Miller books, recent Frank Miller covers, they really are cold. His previous Superman that came out a couple of weeks ago really came out with a whimper more so than a bang. For the most part, the public thinks it's an ant eh book. Uh, if you look at some of the 1 in 100 variants that he did for the last Do uh, Batman series, they just weren't very good quality uh, from what we're used to. So I hate to say that Maybe times passed him by, but it certainly seems like Frank Miller books just in general and today's comic world and today's releases just have subsided as far as the quality 
and more importantly, the crowd that seems to follow him. None of us will ever forget Dark Knight and all that he did with that and others, but unfortunately, there just doesn't seem much, much, much relevancy with today's book. So my cold pick of the week, unfortunately, Frank Miller and his covers and of our stories. First of all, I just want to say, Clint, whatever argument you lost with your wife, you need to make up with her because it's sad seeing you camping out on that in that beach tent with Gary Busey. I, I, saw, I, think, I think I saw him on the side there, but I do want to give him kudos for that awesome pitfall shirt, but yeah. <laughs> Actually, Clint, I'm jealous because he's been on vaca- he was on vacation, it seemed like forever at the beach, right? But um, his cold pick, Frank Miller, what do you think about it, Jack? I have mixed emotions. Brian, you and I kind of came up similar era of comics, so I think you and I have both kind of talked about this before. Like Frank Miller's Daredevil is, you know, it's kind of like one of those series that kind of got me into comics and um, I love it. It's why I've loved the Daredevil Netflix series because it's been pretty true to Frank Miller's um, Daredevil. At the same point, I do get that we're kind of past that era. And Frank Miller's more modern stuff, I've noticed, you and I have talked about this on the channel, a lot of the market is driven by the younger speculator. People are getting into this game, and they're making money, and they're flipping books at a younger and younger age. I've seen a lot of college-age guys, and while I like to think of myself as a young guy, I mean, I'm still a good 12, 13 years removed from that. And we're seeing that those people, they didn't grow up feeling the same way about Frank Miller that you and I did. They didn't grow up with the Daredevil series. They didn't grow up with the Dark Knight being what it is to us. Um, That was a a wall book for me where, you know, I looked at that book as a young kid. I was like, I have to own that. And it was expensive. Um, And I think that we saw a little resurgence when the very first um, Ben Affleck Batman appearance was coming and some of those Dark Knight elements were getting played into it. Um, and it didn't really obviously go the way we'd want. We've talked about that. The DC movies, they've kind of heard a lot of stuff. Um, and Master Race was kind of an unmitigated disaster. Uh, it's funny because it still sold a ton of comics. Retailers made exclusives. They ordered a ton of books. Um, when I say it was an unmitigated disaster, readers didn't like it. Speculators, we got no money out of it. Um, So much so that I see those books on clearance all the time and I pass on it. The only book I've I've really bought on clearance is the Alex Garner Wonder Woman variant that was released during that series. I think that's a nice cover and I think Wonder Woman has unlimited potential. Um, And I would also say I'm still very curious to see if Carrie Kelly ever gets her like day in the sun and that could really pop those books. You know, I think it would all it would take is one movie director saying, you know, I want to do Robin, but I want to do it as a girl. And that's all it would take for Carrie Kelly to then become popular. But the only thing that I'll argue with Clint is he, he did bring it up, but I don't think he gave enough credit to the fact that Superman year one caught people off guard. Now that book has kind of come down to earth per se, but it was after release week going for um, twice cover. And I don't think anybody would have predicted a Frank Miller, John Romita Jr. Who are two guys who have a lot of fans and a lot of detractors um, would do the kind of interest that they had in that book. Now, it'll be interesting to see as issue two gets released, what happens with that book? Will we? Will that popularity remain or will people drop off? But it definitely caught people by surprise. And that lets me know that Frank Miller fandom isn't dead yet. Um, and, but it's definitely not what it was for guys like us growing up. And uh, for that reason, I understand it being a cold pick. So you make out you make a lot of good points, Jack, and I agree with what Clint was saying. And with that, that's gonna wrap up the cold portion, but it's also gonna wrap up the hot and cold list. So let's bring up the hot and cold list for the week. And there we have it. We had our guest pick with Comic Jabroni and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. We talked Walking Dead. No one's gonna deny that those are hot this week. And then we went into Taskmaster. We talked about a little bit of Marvel later printing, especially with that Daredevil number two second print. Sandman being picked up by Netflix and those foreign Bronze Age variants, specifically those Mexican Spidey variants. And then going into the cold list, we had the Road to 300 for Spawn kind of being cold. Black Hammer on a down cycle right now, but we think there's a great buying opportunity there. Modern DC females, that could be another buying opportunity. And then, of course, we wrapped it up with Frank Miller. Jack, 
What do you think about the list this week? I got to say, I really like the list. Sorry to be missing a couple guys for sure. Um, we'd like to get that back up to eight hot picks a week. But at the same point, the quality of the list this week was exceptional. I want to definitely say shout out to the comic, Jabroni. Um, appreciate you stepping in this week. I was glad when we reached out that you were interested and heck of a pick and a great explanation. I, I know I can speak for Brian. I said we'd be happy to have you back. Um, you did a great job. If you guys aren't subscribed, go ahead and hit that uh, subscribe button on his channel because he was early on that show, 1995. Yes. Uh, the, yes. the money was made on that book by being early. So make sure you check his channel out. I also want to say shout out to Tales from the Flip Side. We talked about them tonight on the hot portion when we talked about those Mexican Spidey variants. They were so early with that, and they put out so much great information, not just about those variants, but foreign variants in general, from Marvel to DC um, and kind of everything in between. So be sure to check out Tales from the Flip Side. They are an official CBSI podcast. Um, make sure you check them out. Make sure you subscribe. Check them out on Instagram and follow their individual members as well because they've got a lot of great content they all put out on comicbookinvest.com and all over Instagram, Facebook, etc. So definitely check them out. And then I want to tease something for you guys a little bit. We hit you guys out of nowhere with the comic jabroni this week. Next week, we're going to be bringing on just a Rican and his comics um, that you guys may be familiar with. Check out his YouTube channel and be ready because he's coming next week with a hot pick. Right. So, yes, we're going to have Rod from Just a Rican and his comics. And I want to give a big shout out to all the Patreon members. Thank you so much. Selling out that bolo box, supporting us. We're going to have the latest Patreon Live Hangout coming out. Last one was a blast. Got a lot of great interaction in there. So we hope to get more of those Patreon members in there because there's going to be a lot of information that we're going to be handing out. And remember, the hot cold list is exclusively released on this video premiere first. Make sure you hit that thumbs up button. And if you haven't already done so, please consider subscribing because we are always dropping hot content. And Jack, anything else before we go? Just thank you again, Summerman's Comics family. You guys are amazing. Uh, the community is excellent. I've gotten so many great messages over the last week. Appreciate all of that. And uh, I love seeing, as Brian mentioned earlier, the bolos being shared amongst the Patreons. So amazing. I, it's been cool to throw out some exclusives to the, our most loyal members, but it's even cooler that they're throwing them back at us. So love that community building. Um, not trying to oversell the Patreon, but if you guys aren't members, um, it's, it's something you may want to think about because it is the community with inside the community it is that hardcore Simpleman's Comics fan base. And we appreciate each and every one of you, whether you're a Patreon or not. We love the, the, the conversation that goes on in the chat. We just want to take it further. Right. And with that, we are live tomorrow night at 9 p.m. Eastern for the CBSI Bolo Show. Make sure you come join in the live chat because it is always off the hook on there. And thank you guys so much for watching. And we will see you live tomorrow night.